Throughout our time here at Hopkins Academy, there has been a great deal of change. Our class has been through one new athletic director, two superintendents, three pr separate principals, four different class advisors, more teachers than I can count, and then during our freshman year, four different health teachers. And while change is certainly good, in many situations, it's always nice to have a constant in your life. During our time here at Hopkins, it seems as though Miss April Camuso is that constant. Although her name may have changed, she came to Hopkins in 2009, our seventh grade year, and took over as our class advisor. She then became our English teacher, someone who edits our papers, a friend, and someone we can always go to. And most importantly, someone we can rely on. We're very glad to have her here at Hopkins, and I'm pleased to introduce her as our class speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. April Camuso. Good evening and welcome, administration, faculty, staff, board of trustees, school committee, parents, and students. We are here tonight to celebrate the achievements and commencement of the class of 2014. Firstly, I would like to thank the families of these amazing children sitting behind me. You've played an integral role in the development of these stellar young men and women sitting before you. I would also like to thank the class of 2014 for accepting me as their class advisor and for honoring me with the request for me to speak tonight. I wrote seven different speeches in preparation for tonight, and I am not exaggerating. Besides the fact that I have a little OCD and perhaps a perfectionist problem, I also have a grand fear of public speaking. Your sons and daughters know how terrified I am right now to be up here speaking to you all. So I thought I should clue you in and give you fair warning. I may be comfortable in front of 20 teenagers, but a room like this feels like the ocean roaring in anger at a sailor on a small boat. Therefore, should I stumble over my words or pause with a wild look in my eyes, don't worry, I will come too. <laughs> you see, I couldn't say no to this honor set before me because I've never accepted no as an answer from your children. When they have expressed their own concerns and anxieties about writing an essay or speaking at their capstones, I very maternally told them to suck it up and do it. <laughs> I've told them that they would be fine, fabulous in fact, and each time they've done it. They have never backed down or refused a challenge set before them. I have to say, out of everything that I know about this class, their drive and ambition are what have stood out to me the most. I had to write letters of recommendation for almost half of these seniors, and almost all of them commented that he or she was proactive, determined, or motivated. And while my letters of rec are known to add a little shine when needed, those adjectives were not an exaggeration. Your sons and daughters have worked hard for the last six years. There have been many occasions where I had to ask if they got more than three hours of sleep, to which they usually say no. I've reminded them to pick and choose their battles with academics, sports, work, extracurriculars, and sleep. They don't. They want to do it all. They are on this stage today because of this overriding ambition, and I know that they will continue along that diligent path in college and beyond. There is not one ounce of me that worries for their ability to be successful. However, this is a graduation speech, and as such requires a tad bit of advice. And while I do not worry about the success of your sons and daughters, there are some areas where I think they could put forth that effort and drive, some areas that I think could make them more well-rounded. The first, of course, has to do with my one true love, well, tied with shopping, books. My whole life, I've been a reader, and while I always knew that I wanted to be a teacher, being an English teacher didn't come to me until I was about 20. Regardless of that, I knew the importance of the written word. My mother read to me and my sister all the way through middle school, although by that time, it was more my sister and I reading to her, feeding on the tale of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. I've taken this love for reading and transferred it into my classroom. There are two main reasons that I advocate for reading. The first has to do with what reading does for the mind. Often, I am asked by students how they can improve. They say, how can I have a better vocabulary 
do better on this paper, this test. And I tell them, read. I tell them that not only can reading help them in English class, not only can it help them in school, but that it can help them beyond. I quote President Truman and say, not all readers are leaders, but all leaders are readers. Those who are well-read can articulate themselves in writing and orally, skills that are applicable to any future career. Those who are well-read have an immense database of knowledge in their own mind, waiting to impress those around them. In addition to impressing those around you with facts about the Irish laundries or Richard III, reading opens intangible doors. Books open worlds and lives that they otherwise may never know. Books develop empathy and compassion and certainly imagination. I'm happy to say that many of your sons and daughters do read. And I hope that many others remember the importance of books someday. I hope they remember that it not only helps to keep their intellect up, but that it lets them ponder over what it means to be humans. So again, seniors, I ask you to read. I can no longer assign you any work, but I do ask that you at least keep your mind open to the written word. And speaking of the written word and the entrancing realms that it can create, you all know how much I love William Shakespeare. And for those of you who may not know, you do now. I love him so much that I have skipped entering Notre Dame in Paris twice in order to walk across the street to the Shakespeare and Company bookstore, a bookstore that merely contains the title Shakespeare and a small handful of books about him. It is just a regular English bookstore in the middle of Paris, but it claims Shakespeare and the draw is incredible. Seems a little silly, I know, but the nerd in me just can't seem to enter Notre Dame instead. I am entranced by him and consider it pure blasphemy to even consider that he did not write his own works. Frank McCourt once said that Shakespeare was like having jewels in his mouth, and he was right. The language is beautiful. It is perfect. I know that you don't all see that, and that's okay. But his characters are masterpieces, as each of you should be. So as Polonius gave his son Laertes advice upon his departure to college, I too would like to offer you some as well. Be a Beatrice and not a hero. Beatrice spoke her mind and defended those who could not. Be a Lady Macbeth and not an Ophelia. While Lady Macbeth's end was tragic, her rise to power was one that demonstrated ambition and drive. Take the cleverness from Iago, but the passion and heart of Hamlet. While Iago was a savvy leader, he was a villain of the greatest measure. Take the wit of Benedict and the true love of Ferdinand. Shakespeare's characters are enduring because they demonstrate humanity at its best and worst. I encourage you to find the humanity in yourselves. Find out who you are and what that means. Be the best version of yourself. And most importantly, words taken from Polonius's mouth and my own foot, to thine own self be true. In light of this last piece of advice, I want to share a short anecdote with you. When I was a senior in high school, I knew I wasn't ready for college. I spent all senior year dreading the fall. I was fearful of having to move to UMass and attend classes. I selected UMass, though, for practical reasons. UVM seemed too far and Northeastern too expensive for a teacher. And at this time, people didn't apply to 10 colleges like they do now. So I ended up at UMass, and I lasted about a month there. I attended a few classes and spent no weekends. I hated it. I felt small and meek. There were some classes that had 200 students in them, and some with 500. I couldn't even bring myself to try going to class. So after a month, I withdrew. It was too much. When I told my mother, she was, of course, enraged. First, she was astounded that while she had to sign me into college because I was 17, she did not have to sign me out. Secondly, she knew that I wanted to go to college, to be a teacher, that I loved school. I was an A student in high school, a pleasure to have in class. No discipline record, no back talk. I did all my work, a teacher's dream. It didn't seem to make sense. After a year off from school, I went back. I began at community college, and I transferred to UMass to complete my bachelor's degree. After that, I continued school, earning two masters, and I hoped to continue on to obtain a PhD. You see, college was never the problem. 
What I wanted to do with my life was never the problem. UMass wasn't the problem. The problem was that I didn't listen to myself. I knew that I was not ready, and yet I did nothing about it. I followed the path that I was supposed to follow, and inevitably, it all came crashing down. I let the expectations of others dictate my life, and when I couldn't keep up with those expectations, I had to endure disappointment and guilt, much more than if I stood up for myself originally. Never let the expectations of others override your own mind, your own feelings, your own soul. At the same time, don't regret what has been done. The past is the past. While my college path was by no means traditional, it landed me here in Hadley at a job that I genuinely love coming to every day. Additionally, I learned to listen to my instincts and to place myself as a priority in my life. Having sat through my own high school graduation, I know that few of you will remember anything that I have said tonight. <laughs> Perhaps you will remember that I lectured you about reading again, or that I did not pass out in front of the whole audience. But what I would like you to remember most is how proud I am of all of you. I've enjoyed these six years with you, and I will truly miss you. And I'm sure that all of your teachers feel the same way. Let us know how you are doing and what countless accomplishments you have made. And of course, remember us when you become millionaires or develop a place to live on the moon during Armageddon. But most of all, remember to wake up every day and say, I am fabulous, because class of 2014, you are. Thank you.